Well, when David, uh, he was a, um, a, a nerd, as he says, a scientist, but now he holds the role that he thinks really does achieve his life purpose, and that is that he heads the clean tech group at Oracle Capital, which is an investment bank. So he has some very interesting news for you this evening. So please welcome David Andresen. Good evening. I actually did fly in from Europe, but I was on vacation. I work and I live here. Um, I, was, uh, I was trying to take some time off, but I was actually in meetings with some clean tech hedge funds as well. I wanted to tell you about an interesting um, adventure I've had on my way to becoming a research physicist, and it took a strange turn when I became fascinated with nonlinear chaotic systems. And subsequently, I became very interested in even messier problems called people. Um, I ended up working in corporate finance for the past 20 years. And um, that's actually a picture I took of a lake in northern Scandinavia. It's uh, actually in the Arctic. And when I was a little boy, you could land a Boeing airliner on that lake at the end of April. Today, you can swim there. I would like to speak to you today about clean tech and climate change. This is what I do for a living. This is my passion during working hours, focusing on energy efficiency, renewables, and energy storage. These are all driven by global warming concerns. If it wasn't for the concerns that we have with regards to climate change, clean tech as an industry probably wouldn't exist. So let's look at some of the beginnings of global warming. This is a paper. Everybody's seen many papers. If you look carefully, you'll notice this paper is dated 1896. So not terribly recent. The history of global warming actually starts even further back, about 1824. Fourier hypothesized that humans might be changing the climate. And then Arrhenius, 1896, he's a Nobel laureate. Um, he determined, he theorized correctly that the burning of fossil fuels may change the climate by increasing global temperatures. Fast forward to 1966, top US scientists suggested to the Johnson administration that in global um, climate intervention might seem reasonable because of global warming threats to the US. Fast forward to 2005, Kyoto Protocol is in force. Um, and then in the last few years, we've had some very interesting findings in paleoclimatology, which is quite a mouthful, but basically means the study of ancient climate and climate change. 10, 20 years ago, if you asked leading scientists how climate has changed on this planet, they would tell you it's over centuries or millennia. Recent findings suggest that change on this planet can occur in decades, very short time scales, and for forcings, meaning changes to the system, which are lighter than what we are applying today. So with that information, what have we done? From the Industrial Revolution, you can see our greenhouse gas emissions are going through the roof. And they're actually not really slowing down. If you look at the composition of CO2 in the atmosphere, the leading greenhouse gas, it's actually, we're not slowing down at all. It's actually accelerating. Um, 392, I believe, is the current number on that graph. That's parts per million. And if you look at the, the ancient climate history, as far as stable climate, in order to grow food, which is the most important thing, 
you need 280 to 270 parts per million. We're in the penalty zone. And the truth is nobody knows what's going to happen and what time scale. So what does this future look like? The largest greenhouse gas emitter is now China. They talk about lowering their carbon intensity, which is refreshing. But what they mean is the amount of carbon they produce by unit of economic output. And because their economy is growing so fast, they do not plan in stabilizing their emissions until 2050, which means we're going to have increasing emissions in the coming decades. We have issues with uh, ocean acidification, meaning the supply of seafood may well be compromised. And then you have the likelihood, and we don't, we don't know the risks. The risks are unbounded. There's many unknown unknowns, but there's a possibility of large-scale climate change, and it could be abrupt. Sometimes scientists will talk about flipping into an, another climate regime. And if that climate re regime means that you can't grow food for 7 billion people, it creates national security concerns. Um, Wall Street is good at reacting to many things, but having worked with hedge funds in Wall Street, they, they're not ready for this one. So what solutions with this dire scenario? What can we do? What's going to happen? Well, I think there's, there's still a lot of hope, and I think we're going to make it through. But it's going to be difficult, and the solutions aren't easy. Um, within the last year, the U.S. has started to seriously look into changing the Department of Energy from being essentially the Department of Nuclear Weapons Management to actually being the Department of Energy in in increasing innovations in new energy research, essentially carbon neutral technologies. Part of my job requires me to study everything that's in the pipeline within clean tech. And I can tell you there are some very, very interesting and promising technologies in the pipeline, maybe five, ten years away, maybe a little further, but they're in the pipeline. And it does give me a lot of hope. Um, Essentially, in the, the most important areas, renewables, solar, wind, and as well as nuclear. So these are car carbon-free energy. We have to eliminate, not reduce the emissions, but eliminate. It has to be a change of consciousness here with, with regards to that language. And very important, if we're planning on having renewable solar, wind, and other types of renewable clean energy, you need to have large-scale energy storage, as well as smart grids, so that you're sending energy from like solar daytime producers to where it's being used, as well as wind that's usually at night. So you have to balance the grid. It becomes much more complex. The grid we have today would be recognizable to somebody that worked in the utility industry 100 years ago. Obviously, somebody in the telecommunications industry from 100 years ago could not recognize the infrastructure today. But if you look at the grid, it is essentially very similar. So we really have not made significant improvements there. The entire grid architecture, the way power is produced and deployed, has to change completely. And the, the excellent, um, what gives me hope is that there are some truly great innovations. And I would bet my money on new solar as well as energy storage. What can the market offer us? We're, we're taught that markets with perfect information and rational players can do very efficient things. But the truth is, it's not really a free market. There is very little as far as transparency with information. We can't even agree as to what the physical reality is of global warming. So. I think, unfortunately, until we have a, a significant climate event that everybody can agree on, and I don't know what this might be, 
possibly a Katrina times 20, a uh, lowland uh, flooding um, in some area of the developing world most likely, or some massive crop failure in Asia. Whatever that is, it, would be, it will be tragic. But unfortunately, for markets to become efficient, I think that is the trigger that will be necessary. Um, at that point, governments will have to put in rational carbon markets as well as start managing global warming as a defense issue because it is about threat mitigation. The unfortunate thing is what the human cost will be for that transition. And that, that's a big unknown. Um, another solution that is going to be necessary is going to be geoengineering, which has been in the shadows for many, many years. And that is the, the airbag, the parachute that you need before the collision. If you're driving, if you're accelerating a vehicle towards a granite boulder um, at night in the dark, <laughs> it's a good idea to have an airbag. So as far as global warming, this is the airbag. What this means is an intentional modification of climate globally. And this comes in two flavors. This has been discussed in the scientific community for over six decades, and it's still not being discussed broadly, but that will change. There's two flavors of geoengineering, and one is solar radiation mitigation, which is essentially reducing the amount of, of solar radiation that hits the surface of the Earth. And we're talking maybe a fraction of 1%. And the other flavor is carbon sequestration. Um, in order to arrest a dangerous global warming acceleration, you need to put this airbag in place. It's not something you want to use, but it's something you need to research. And it is not a solution. It is not a substitution for, for becoming carbon neutral. It, it only buys you time, just like a parachute. <laughs> um, it slows down the time. So what this will do is it will allow, once everybody understands what the real threat is, is to quickly adapt to carbon neutral and start actually pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. This is going to require international treaty because modifying climate um, unilaterally is in contravention to international law. Um, the solar radiation mitigation part of geoengineering is very problematic because it is not something that is commercial. It is not something that a VC could ever invest in. This is something that has to be deployed like you would have a standing army. You would not outsource the U.S. Army to a developing country. <laughs> Likewise, this is something that has to be done solely for defense. It cannot be... Uh, for profit, and until there's an international agreement and an awareness that this is something that might be necessary, it can only be researched, it should not be deployed. It's only for study. Um, Long-term carbon sequestration is very promising as far as a commercial solution, but for that you need a carbon market. Right now, carbon markets are very frail and do not represent the physical reality. But once you have a, climat a climactic event, the price of carbon will be real, and you can harness market forces to reduce carbon, to possibly take it out of the atmosphere, possibly putting like nuclear reactors online to take out carbon out of the atmosphere. So the conclusion, it's going to be a rough transition, but we're going to make it. We have the technology's coming. We can buy time with geoengineering, but the biggest challenges are going to be political. And there's a couple recommendations which I would suggest. One is to increase the discussion of geoengineering broadly. It should not be something um, that is discussed behind closed doors. This is something as an open society, as a democracy, and internationally, that needs to be discussed. We need to increase basic science funding to 
advance and cut the timeline for innovation in carbon neutral technologies as well as geoengineering and international cooperation is a critical necessity. In the end, it's not going to be just the technology that's going to save us. We're going to need to engage fully in our humanity, which means seeing others as ourselves so that we can cooperate internationally to address this most critical challenge. Thank you.